Um, for our second team talk, uh, they'll be pre presenting How Are We Distinct? Multimodal Specializations of Human Cortical Neurons. In this talk, they'll highlight the use of complementary approaches uh, in the human cell types program to characterize the differences in transcript transcriptomic and morphoelectric properties of neurons in human cortex and modeling the effects of these differences. Uh, representing the team is Tom Chartrand, Brian Kalmbeck, Trig Vibakin, and Nick Jorstad. Please join me in welcoming them. Great, so uh, brain morphology has diversified dramatically across mammalian evolution. Um, you saw this in vertebrates and Maria's beautiful talk, uh, but in mammals as well, there's a broad diversity and you can see large brains have appeared in multiple clades uh, across, uh, across the tree, but uh, is not a universal feature. But certainly with these larger brains, um, there is a larger cortex. So uh, human, human cortex is about a thousand fold larger than mouse cortex. And this is driven by a extended um, neural development period, a greater number of neural progenitors, and um, not just an expansion of the cortical area, but also the cortical thickness. And as you saw from Maria, that, that this, uh, really this increase in the number of progenitors um, creating creating the different layers of cortex, particularly the superficial layers, les, leads to this th slight thickening of cortex and also diversification of the types within it. So some of the, the work here um, has these morphological reconstructions from layer two, three pyramidal neurons in the, in the superficial layers. You can see just, just by eye qualitatively that there's a broader diversity of these uh, morphological types in the human cortex than, than in the mouse. So today uh, you'll hear from, from Nick, uh, who will tell you about some of the cross-species comparisons we're doing uh, between mouse, marmoset, and human in primary motor cortex, uh, looking at the transcriptomic features of those cells. Uh, you'll hear about a morphoelectric specialization in human uh, for this one type of cell, the layer five uh, pyramidal neuron type that you'll hear from Brian. And then Tom will tell you about some modeling work uh, trying to interpret differences in morphoelectric features of layer two, three excitatory neurons. So in uh, motor cortex, many, many years of work have already shown specializations between the primate and rodent. Um, one striking feature is these, are these very large cells in deep layer five. Uh, you can just see with the naked eye, they're known as gigantopyramidal neurons or BET cells in motor cortex. Uh, they have very large soma, uh, it can be 80 to 100 micron diameter. And they compose part of the cortical spinal tract that uh, projects from cortex to the spinal cord, uh, as the name suggests, um, and synapse on either inhibitory interneurons or um, lower motor neurons in the spinal segments. And uh, one feature that's quite distinct in pri primates is that a larger percentage of these neurons will, will synapse directly on these lower motor neurons, whereas they tend to project to the interneurons in rodents. And this is thought to underlie um, differences in motor control, such as fine hand movement. So uh, now that we have these nice multi-omics methods that we can apply at scale um, and allows us to really make quantitative comparisons between cellular features uh, across species, um, not just for individual cell types, but hopefully in a more comprehensive way across all the cells in cortex. So we can really ask some, some just basic questions. For example, uh, how many cell types can we distinguish based on their uh, gene expression profiles in these three species? Um, how well can they be matched? Uh, how, how conserved are they? Are there species-specific types? And are, by intuition, of course, we expect, and lots of other work, uh, that primate cortex should look more similar to human than, than rodent. Uh, but we can put some quantification on this. Um, and then we can look for molecular features of some of these known specializations, such as these layer five BET cells. Uh, so this uh, data comes for, from human, from post-mortem human brain. Uh, we don't get neurosurgical specimens from the primary motor cortex um, very often or ever um, for obvious reasons. But these come from coronally slabbed um, post-mortem brain that can then be aligned to our reference atlas based on the jar of folding patterns and uh, confirmed by, based on histology, particularly uh, handy in the M1 uh, where you see these BET cells. And then we can isolate uh, 
This is work by my colleague Rebecca Hodge, um, but isolating uh, individual nuclei from the dissociated tissue. And you can profile the genes that are expressed and some of the epigenetic features uh, of those cells. So this, this project that you'll hear about is a broad consortium effort through the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network. Um, these were some of the labs, many of the labs that were involved, and this is data, again, RNA-seq data, single nucleus methylomes, and open chromatin information from these cells, but we'll focus on the RNA-seq data here today. So with that, I'll hand it over to Nick. I can tell you more. Thank you. So I'm going to cover some of the research highlights from the three species integration of human, marmoset, and mouse. And so we have uh, tens of thousands of isolated nuclei from each species, and we're trying to look for similarities and differences between these types. And so the initial predictions we came up with from this analysis are that expression divergence will reflect evolutionary distance, with marmoset being closer about half the evolutionary distance to human than mouse. Um, that cell type homologies are going to be higher resolution between human and marmoset, meaning uh, you should get more one-to-one -one cell type mapping with a closer species, evolutionarily speaking. And uh, marker genes would be more conserved between human and marmoset because they are evolutionarily closer. So let's dig into some of the data. So here is a TSNE plot of the inhibitory inner neurons. So these are GABAergic cells. This is all of them from all three species. And so in one of these plots, each dot represents an individual nucleus that was sequenced and uh, thousands of genes detected. And their location in this two-dimensional space is based on the expression of these thousands of different genes. And so on this left plot, we can see the cells labeled by species. And the main takeaway from this I want you to see is that a lot of these cells overlap and intermix. It's not really big clouds of individual species. And so this really suggests that the cell type expression profiles might be pretty similar between cell types across species. And then based on uh, statistical similarities of these different cell types, we can group them into clusters. And so in this case, a uh, cluster corresponds to what we call a, a cross-species cell type. And so we had identified 45 different uh, GABAergic interneuron clusters here. And so there are many different ways to assess how well these three different data sets can be integrated and kind of how the cell types interact uh, and align with one another. And so on the left here, I'm showing the average local structure score. So this is a metric which um, basically takes the nearest neighbors of a cell and all of its nearest neighbors in an individual species and then how those change when you do the three species integration. So if it were optimal and perfect, uh, all the nearest neighbors would be the same in the individual species analysis and the combined analysis. And so what you're seeing here is all uh, three species local structure score is around 80%. So around 80% of the nearest neighbors are maintained when you integrate the data with a slight bias towards the mouse data structure. Um, on the right here is the anchor score. And so the cartoon on the right depicts a particular human cell type with links to a identical or closely related marmoset cell type. And so an anchor would be the length of this link. So if it were a perfect expression match uh, in both species, the score would be one. Um, and so we're, what we're seeing here is that the human and marmoset anchors tend to have higher scores than the mouse and human anchors, suggesting that the expression, the global expression profile is more similar between those cell types. And then down on the x-axis, you can see we've performed this analysis at different downsampled uh, subsets of the data, and it seems to be the trends seem to be robust across that. So here in this plot, um, I'm showing we have analyzed and curated all these clusters in each species very thoroughly. And so on the y-axis, or as these rows, are the human-specific consensus cell types of inhibitory neurons, and on the x-axis we have the marmoset curated clusters and the mouse curated clusters. And so the darker red indicates um, when you integrate these together, which cell types map to the same clusters over here. 
And so you can see there are instances of many-to-many -many relationships where you have these VIP cells mapping four to four, so it's kind of mapping at the supertype level, not at the individual cell type level. But there are also instances of one-to-one -one mapping with this uh, NPY chaudal type mapping one-to-one -one in marmoset and human, and I believe in mouse and human as well, but um, here I'm also highlighting the chandelier cells which have the same relationship. It's a very high confidence mapping one-to-one, -one, which suggests a uh, highly evolutionarily conserved cell type. And we're gonna be hearing a lot more about chandelier cells in a couple talks later this afternoon. So here, I'm just trying to give you a snapshot of how evolution might have changed these different inhibitory cell types. So across the top in rainbow colors are the different cross-species consensus clusters. So when you integrated the data, here are the 40-some-odd clusters we identified. And then I've pulled just the human cells out and plotted them in this heat map, just the marmoset cells and just the mouse cells. And so these uh, differentially expressed genes were determined based on the human pairwise comparisons, and then those same genes were uh, shown for marmoset cells and mouse cells. And what you can see is as evolutionary time progresses, you start to lose the distinctness of these differentially expressed genes for a given cluster. So the marmoset, you can still see this diagonal line of highly expressed genes, and in the mouse, it starts to fade out. And that really suggests that the mouse might have uh, some isoform differences or maybe even different pathways altogether to, um, to instill the same function of these cells. And so everything I've shown you previously was based on inhibitory GABAergic cells. We also have uh, done the same analysis for glutamatergic excitatory and non-neuronal cells. So here, uh, again, are the human consensus cell types against the mouse and marmoset consensus types. And I just wanted to highlight uh, the layer five ET types. So in human, these are, there are three of these that we have transcriptomically identified, and these correspond to these massive, monstrous BET cells, which Trigva alluded to earlier. Um, but they seem to have a pretty good homologue, or a homologous type in mouse and marmoset as well. And so uh, Rebecca Hodge, who is a senior scientist here at the Allen Institute, has been working to validate these different layer 5 ET types. So here on the left, you can see uh, each one of the three types. And here are different combinations of marker genes which can distinguish them. And so far, she's been able to resolve two of these types uh, in actual tissue. And so I don't expect you to be able to see all these little dots. But the main thing I want you to see is the size of these cells and the scale bar here. So these are like 80 micron uh, somas. They're absolutely enormous, and they seem to express the same combination of these transcriptomically identified cells. Um, really briefly, so here are the various potassium channels uh, in all these different um, excitatory cells, and so you can see that there are different banding patterns and very distinctive channel properties associated with each of these types. Here are the layer 5 ET cells, and there's some really interesting electrophysiological properties which Brian in the next talk is going to uh, present to you, but I just wanted to kind of give you a snapshot at how we're starting to think about how these channels might inform uh, some of the electrophysiology function we're seeing. So here's Brian. Okay, so it, it turns out that this, these ET neurons in, uh, in primate cortex, especially in human, are, are relatively rare. And so to, to aid in our ability to, to target these cells for, uh, for physiological analysis, uh, we developed a, 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 a genetic tool to, to label these, these cells. Uh, so this is based on an on, on enhancer discovered by, uh, by Basilica uh, Lucas and Tanya. Uh, you'll hear more about um, their enhancer discovery uh, tomorrow, so I encourage you to attend that. So we leverage this enhancer in an AAV, um, uh, and using this, we can we can label ET neurons in um, in in mouse, uh, in human uh, MTG middle temporal gyrus, and also in macaque uh, temporal cortex. So one thing to notice here is that, um, the, again, like I said, the relative abundance of labeling um, is, is different. So in mouse, you see many different layer 5 neurons here. 
in human temporal, uh, temporal cortex, there's literally like w one cell here. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, interestingly, the, uh, in monkey, in macaque, it's somewhere in between. Okay, so this, this allows us to go in and, and uh, perform patch clamp or patch seek experiments on, uh, on these labeled cells. And so here's just an exemplar experiment from human MTG um, uh, where we see uh, uh, sort of a triple modality here that in all the modalities are, are consistent with, with this being an ET neuron. So if we look at the morphology, this is a bio, biocytin filled uh, cell. Um, it's, it's a nice big thick tufted sort of classic ET uh, morphology. Uh, it has physiological uh, hallmarks of an ET neuron and uh, just one I'll point out here is this is a voltage response to a, to a sinusoidal current injection. Um, this current injection increases in frequency over time, so it's sort of like a, a swept sine wave. And the thing to notice is that the maximum voltage deflection um, is, is somewhere in the middle. So it has this bandpass filtering property. Uh, and then this cell, uh, when we extract the RNA from this cell and uh, send it off for sequencing, it maps to the appropriate, um, the, the transcriptomic type we think is the ET type. So now we can, uh, we can use this tool to, uh, to label ET neurons um, and specialize ET neurons in other parts of cortex. And in this case, uh, what I'm showing, this is M1 from macaque. So uh, as Trigva said, this is a part of cortex that we, we would never receive from, uh, from a surgical specimen. Uh, and so uh, we, we do have a nice collaboration with, with University of Washington uh, where we have access to this macaque tissue. Uh, and so we can use this enhancer to label these putative BET cells. The thing to notice here again is that it labels these nice big layer five neurons. Uh, and then um, uh, we can go in just as before and target these cells for patch clamp and patch seek recordings. So uh, it turns out that these cells have really distinctive physiological properties. And I'll just summarize it as they, they're like a pyramidal neuron that has spiking properties like a fast spiking interneuron. Um, it's something that I've never really seen in a pyramidal neuron before. Uh, so to highlight this uh, in the next few slides, I'm just gonna compare, this is pretty preliminary, but I'm gonna compare uh, these ET neurons in temporal cortex from macaque to, to M1. So on the left here, this is a new end stain, and uh, not to beat a dead horse, but, but these cells are absolutely gigantic. So this is the same scale in temporal cortex and M1. So here's a BET cell. And I always like to say you could fit like three or four of the surrounding pyramidal neurons within the soma of the BET cell. They're just absolutely huge. Um, so again, as I pointed out earlier, uh, both uh, M1 and, and temporal cortex ET neurons have this band pass filtering property. So again, this is a voltage response uh, to this sinusoidal current injection. Uh, on average, the, uh, the frequency where this peak happens is a little higher in M1. And then perhaps the more dramatic difference here is, uh, is input resistance. The input resistance of these M1 BET cells, are abs it's absolutely sort of bottoms out at about eight, eight megaohms in some cases. Um, okay, so on to the spiking. Uh, again, this, this is uh, really distinctive spiking properties. So um, one thing we noticed is that these M1 BET cells can, can sustain very high firing rates. And to illustrate this, uh, this is just a, an example experiment again. Uh, so here I'm increasing the current injection and measuring the number of spikes. Um, so uh, what you can see in temporal cortex is that there reaches a, a current injection where the cell can no longer spike, so sodium channels kind of go into block, reaches asymptote. Um, you can see that here in the, in the sample uh, voltage sweep, spikes get really short. Um, so this happens at about two nanoamps in, in temporal cortex. In, in M1, this is, this is the response to six nanoamps of current. In fact, you can see here uh, in uh, the average firing rate that it's pretty linear over this whole range. In fact, I don't think I really even found the current injection where spikes fail. Um, I had to, I'm gonna have to like 
switch my head stage up or something like that. I can't inject enough current to, to really find that. So, um, okay. So the other thing we noticed is that for prolonged depolarizations, uh, these, two, these two cell types uh, respond very differently. So this is a, this is a 10 second current injection. Um, what you see in temporal cortex, and this is just an example, is that uh, the cell decelerates its firing rate over time. So at, uh, in the first second, it's firing at about five hertz. In the last second, it's firing at about two hertz. And in M1, you see this, this crazy spiking pattern here where it, it fires five hertz here, kind of goes silent. You can see the voltage ramping up, and then it just goes crazy, and it actually accelerates throughout that whole last part. And so on average, uh, the, the cells double their firing rate. I've seen it quadruple their, fi their firing rate in some, some examples. And then lastly, uh, the last thing I just wanted to mention is that, um, as you might expect with this fast firing phenotype, the spikes for these M1, so if you zoom in on a single spike, uh, they're, they're incredibly narrow. Um, so the average is uh, below half a millisecond. So again, this is, this is a lot like a fast spiking interneuron, but it's a pyramidal neuron. It's, it's pretty crazy. Okay, finally, uh, so we do occasionally get some rare surgical specimens uh, uh, from nearby M1. So this is a particular case that came from uh, the superior frontal gyrus, actually right at the junction of the precentral gyrus. So this is M1. Our surgical specimen came here, and there were these gigantocellular neurons in layer five that we were able to patch. Um, again, here's a biocytin fill. Uh, I don't know if you can really appreciate, but again, the cells are huge. Um, the, the, the sort of width of the basal dendrites is a, is a millimeter. Uh, and then, uh, I won't belabor the point, but uh, this cell looks a lot like the monkey M1 neurons that uh, the spiking phenotypes that we saw on the previous slide. Very low input resistance, very fast firing, pronounced fast AHPs, narrow spikes, accelerating uh, um, spike trains over time. And so now Tom is gonna tell you about how we're using computational modeling to gain insight into how these physiological differences translate into differences in, um, in input-output properties. So Brian gave us a nice portrait of this really unique cell type we can find by targeted recording steep in layer five. Um, but you might be wondering, since at the beginning we mentioned that the mo one of the more prominent gross anatomical differences between primate cortex and rodents, say, is the expansion of layers two, three. So can we see those that anatomical difference reflected at the single cell level as well? And the answer is certainly yes. Um, and this is a question that we're really well poised to address using the pipeline data collection uh, using the PatSeq protocol. So we have about a couple hundred cells, both on the human and mouse side here, um, with morphology, electrophysiology, and transcriptomics that we can draw from to address this question. Um, the differences in layer two, three aren't super obvious from the transcriptomics. I mean, there, it, that there is a difference is somewhat reflected in the fact that the cross-species mapping is a little fuzzy here, so it, we can't assign one-to-one -one relationships between mouse and human cells, but rather all excitatory cells are mapped uh, in one homologous type. Um, but if we just plot a few morphologies like I've done here, so human on the top and mouse on the bottom, we see that there's a stark contrast. So the human cells, um, there's a huge range of sizes through the depths of layer two, three, um, because um, easily interpreted in the sense that these bottom cells also want to reach their, den their apical dendrites up to layer one, um, and so are, have this strong demand to form really large dendrites. Um, whereas mouse, the, the layer is fairly thin, so the cells don't need that degree of diversity. Now we'd like to also make this sort of comparison more quantitative and extend it to different morphological features and electrophysiological features as well. Um, this is something my colleague Anatoly has worked on to some degree. Um, so we extract features across um, all the data we have for, and then compare at the level of homologous types between mouse and human and find which types have uh, how many statistically significant differences. Um, and the picture that's coming out is that the differences are more the rule than the exception here. So um, some of these types we don't yet have, not have enough data for, the ones on the x-axis, but for the ones we do, maybe about half have quite a number of significantly different features. Um, so we have a problem of kind of narrowing this down into which differences are more functionally relevant and uh, address interesting cross-species differences.
And one, one specific way we can get at that is to ask, in which cases are the differences directly explained by some of these larger scale stru structural differences? Um, uh, so to be more precise, there are properties like input resistance that are directly affected as a consequence of cell size. So as the membrane area gets larger, um, the input resistance changes directly. That's maybe a little bit less interesting than something like a, a more direct co uh, condensation where the active dendritic integration properties might change to compensate for the longer dendrites found in those deep human cells. Um, or there's also, of course, the possibility of, find, of new types in one species or unique functional roles um, that we could get at by removing these two possibilities. But um, the second one here, this idea of active compensation is the, one, the um, case I'm gonna look at using some biophysical modeling. Uh, so one of the more prominent electrophysiological features different between excitatory cells in layer two, three, between human and mouse, um, is a set of properties that are, that are all linked to a, specific, a single channel, IH, so the HCN channel, um, which is found uniquely in the deep cells in human. And it's reflected in this um, four to five hertz resonance in frequency response in those deep cells. It's not found in mouse, um, as well as in the sag response or overshoot to hyperpolarizing current injection. Um, and so in a previous paper, published by, um, started by my colleagues Brian and Anatoly again. Um, Anatoly did some modeling work that suggested IH was playing, the IH reflected in these properties um, has an interesting functional role in dendritic integration, um, which is relevant to these deep human cells, again, because they have long dendrites um, in general the somatic effect of PSP is going to depend on the location of that synapse, and a large cell is going to have the problem that um, the somatic PSP is going to be different depending where on the dendrites that synapse is located. And so there have been suggestions in literature before, and initially these mod modeling supported um, the fact that IH could help smooth out these differences and maintain location independence of the synaptic response, which could be critical for those deep cells. Uh, but to test this hypothesis in more detail and really leverage the pipeline data we have, and what we wanted is actually models at the single cell level for both superficial and deep cells um, throughout the depths of layer two, three. And so my colleague Ani and I have been working on generating models for individual cells from that data. He'll tell you a little bit more about this this afternoon in another team talk. Um, but in short, what we hope to do is capture not just somatic active properties, but uh, dendritic active properties by optimizing models to match the somatic current injection response. Um, so even though we don't have recordings out there in the dendrites, the effect of a given channel um, on, say, the response to a hyperbolizing current injection at the soma is going to be a little bit different in subtle ways, depending whether that channel is located localized to the soma or the dendrites. And we hope that by optimizing in detail the response to um, subthreshold and spiking current injections, we can generate a functional model for that cell and predictions for where the channels are locali localized. Um, and in the case of these excitatory cells, so throughout layer two, three, um, we've run this process, optimized models for about 30 individual cells and generated multiple models per cell as well. Um, and the, the process predicts that we have an increasing um, conductance density uh, of IH through the depth, through depth, so this is normalized depth through layer two, three, um, both at the soma and in the dendrites of those cells. So that's pretty interesting on its own. It's, um, generate, it's predicting that this is coming from IH, as, as I was suggesting earlier. Um, but that's not really the point of this modeling. It's, it's not to have a static prediction. It's to have a dynamic model that we can simulate and test scenarios that we didn't test in the experimental pipeline. Um, so the process I go through here is to simulate synapses along the dendrites and again test the amplitude of the postsynaptic post potential at the soma. Um, and we find that deep cells that have that IH channel present um, show a very slow decay of PSP amplitude with distance as compared to the ones with less IH that are more superficial have the strong decay. Um, and the picture that's emerging across, not just across these cells, but the whole data set is that IH is contributing to PSP location independence um, across that population of cells and helping normalize um, the response despite that morphological diversity. All right, so to wrap up and to remind you a little bit what my colleagues have shown, um, we showed that human cortical cell types generally more closely resemble monkey than, than mouse, of course, based on multiple modalities, gene expression, morphology, and electrophysiology. 
Um, we've shown that we have a unique layer five type that expresses distinct ion channels, um, contributing to unique spiking properties. Um, I showed that the diversity of layer two, three PR middle cells that's unique to human can, um, might reflect compensation for the cell size changes that are direct that accompany the cortical expansion. Um, and looking forward at the future, the patch data collection that's going on and new genetic tools coming online, I think are gonna enable us to do many more comparisons across these different modalities and unified create unified functional pictures for these differences. So thanks to our founder, um, and of course to all the teams that I haven't had time to credit who contributed to this data. We have time for a few questions. Just raise your hand and a mic will come to you. Do you have any idea why certain cell types display that resonance in the um, frequency response? So, um, well, it's I mean, one case is IH, so the, the picture that I, that I was showing in layer two, three, Brian did actually show through some pharmacology that in that case it was certainly IH contributing, but there's other examples as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would just add that um, oh, it, it, it endows neurons with different frequency selectivities as well. So um, it, it, uh, it directly contributes to differences in, in how those cells integrate, what sort of frequencies they, they, they prefer to. So, yeah. Down here in the front. <coughs> So I find it really interesting to see the electrophysiological diversity, both between human and the mouse uh, cortical neurons, like, such as the layer two, three cortical neurons, as well as between temporal and, and motor cortical um, layer five ET cells or the bat cells. Um, I think this is, this re this is really related to uh, our current thinking about in terms of how to define a cell type. I mean, you see dramatic difference in terms of physiological properties between human and mouse, and yet at the same time, you call them the same cell type or, or different or homologous cell types. Um, I would say that that kind of difference is much more significant than say the physiological difference uh, between molecularly defined or transcriptomically defined cell types within a species. So here, um, how to reconcile that? Is electrophysiology an important defining feature for cell types or not? Um, so that's cro cross species. I, maybe it's a question or comment. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to see how you guys think about this. Um, also, uh, I would be anxiously waiting for patch seek data uh, to see if the bat cells um, and the temporal cortex ET cells have different transcriptomic profiles or gene expression profiles or not to, to reflect their, their tremendous physiological difference. Um, and the fact that you see bad cells um, that are present in different transcriptomic types is another thing intriguing, right? So you wanted to see if there is a within type heterogeneity uh, between bats and non bat cells. So it, it's a lot of questions and comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, ph physiology, it's, it, uh, um, I mean, how do I say, I'm a patch clamp physiologist, but we, we have to acknowledge that the cell is just more than the soma, um, that, uh, uh, you know, the, the cell's function and how it relates to its transcriptomic type very well may involve differences in things like dendritic integration, which I think we can get at to some extent with some of our modeling efforts uh, with with Tom, uh, but also direct, you know, we can we can study dendrites too. It's, it's feasible. So um, we do have patch seek uh, data. We have transcriptomic data f from from all of those experiments, and we're definitely looking into um, to differences. So there are clear. If you just look at the single nucleus RNA sequencing data, there are clear differences between temporal cortex um, and, and M1. And, and so a lot, a lot of those, some of those differences relate to things like potassium channels and stuff like that. So those, those are areas that we're exploring, for sure. Yeah, just shout out to this. Uh, I think one follow-up comment. Uh, this is something that uh, I have discussed with other people, uh, which is the issue of unclassified, unsupervised classification of the cell types. Uh, so I think that's a very important issue. 
analysis find gene correlates for physiological properties. It seems like that, that may not be apparent if you just look at transcriptomic data alone. Sure. I think up down yeah. the corner. Just what, sorry, just one piece to that response that, I mean, I think we also think of homology in terms of shared developmental origin um, and, and connectivity. And so even though M1, these corticospinal neurons in M mouse and human look so different based on their electrical properties, they, they clearly have shared you know, other, other features. So. For, uh, I have a question for Brian is, is this difference in some of the IH pattern, how, to what extent this, is this uh, normalizing for cell size? And can you look in, say, animals that have similarly large, uh, cor you know, like larger cortical sizes, but are not human to see it, to what extent it's human specific? So are you, are you referring to the layer two, three? Yeah, so I think, um, th this is one thing we're looking at is that clearly even macaque brain is much bigger than mouse. And so it, Tom, Tom threw in there a little, uh, a little voltage response to a chirp from a cac from a layer three neuron. And it, it, you know, it, it certainly looks resonant. Um, so I think it probably has something to do with, with just how big the cells are. I think um, the, the, the cells have to solve this problem with having a big dendrite uh, in um, synapses arriving distally uh, are gonna be filtered severely just by the passive properties of the dendrite. And so IH is a way to sort of solve this. I'm sure there are other reasons, but um, yeah, that's, that's one reason. Okay, I think we'll have to stop with questions there, um, but let's thank the team again.